What's up, internet friends, founders, and the Entree Pro Curious? You've made it, and you're here. It's Adventure Daily. News bits from a founder's perspective. That's right, guys. Smash the like button. It is Tuesday in the month of March. Amazing. We have made it so far, so fast. I can't believe it. I really can't. If you think about it, man, time just goes by way too fast. I hope you guys are having a great Tuesday morning. For some of you guys, it might be Tuesday afternoon because we got people all over the world. If you're listening to us on Spotify or iTunes or Google Play, we're glad you're here, guys. We got a great couple news bits from a founder's perspective today. And I'm going to tell you a story at the end during the final word from me. The final word from me uh, to the community. I had a pretty crappy, I had a pretty crappy meeting with a couple of VCs, a couple of venture capitalists uh, yesterday. And I wanna give you guys a story about it. But first and foremost, the first news bit from a founder's perspective, we're gonna be talking about entrepreneurial passion and whether that actually backfires at a team level. Now we know that the entrepreneurial passion is exactly what is required to be successful in any type of entrepreneurship endeavor or startup startup, uh, company. Right, so you need that passion. However, what about your team members? What if they have diverging passions in other places that actually could backfire in a big way? So we're gonna go through that. The second news article is very simple. Being yourself, that's right. Being yourself is pretty much the best way to be successful. It really is. And so this, you know, the Venture Daily news from a founder's perspective, as well as my, my, uh, the things that I talk about at the end uh, for community is really my way of being as authentic as I can of what's going on in this business as I'm growing this platform, growing my venture fund, and growing my network. And so I'm just trying to be uh, as authentic and real as I can. You let me know in the comments below if I'm doing a bad job. But that's for the two news bits today. I'm excited to go over them. Let's jump in, my friends. Let's jump in. When entrepreneurial passion backfires for teams. This one's by Ava Del Mole. Passion is the fuel that entrepreneurs need to keep going. Research shows that passion is a key predictor of entrepreneurs' creativity, persistence, and venture performance. In other words, the more passionate the entrepreneur, the more likely they are to succeed. Absolutely. Does the same idea apply to entrepreneurial teams? After all, the majority of new ventures are started and led by teams, and research shows that the way in which entrepreneurial team members work together plays an important role in determining venture outcomes. But it's not clear how passion influences things. Does passion always lead to great teamwork? Is it more is more passion the better? What happens if one of team of the team members is very passionate and another isn't passionate at all? What if people are passionate about two different things or three? We conducted a study to understand how passion affects entrepreneurial teams. By conducting surveys with 107 tech teams participating in an accelerator program, we found that diversity of passion among individual team members in terms of how passionate they are and what they're passionate about had a negative relationship, a negative relationship with team performance due to conflicting emotions and identities within the team. We also found that high diversity in passion is more harmful during the later stages of venture development. Now, I can speak to this 100%. I can tell you that as a passionate founder, as a passionate entrepreneur, I'm passionate about anything that I do, I have to invariably, after getting venture funding or getting to a point of sustainability or traction or growth, I have to hire a team. I have to bring a team on board. And there's so many things that I, I could probably save this for another podcast, but there's so many things that I'm looking for. But one of them actually isn't passion. Bum, 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 bum. I know. One of the things that I actually don't look for is passion. And the reason is, is because I'm ridiculously passionate about my project. I'm ridiculously purposeful and intentional around what I'm doing in my work. However, I can never expect, and this has just been my experience, 
15 plus years in building startups. In my experience, I just can't expect anyone else to be as passionate about what I'm doing and what I'm creating, you know, as me, it's just not possible. What I am, however, during that hire, hiring process, what I'm looking for is not passion about the project or the project work or the project direction. What I'm looking for are passionate, dedicated and disciplined people towards what they enjoy doing and figuring out how I can integrate that into my small team. That is far more useful because then I can leverage their passions and not just hire them for a role and find out that their passions are for something else. These are the types of questions. If you're a founder or if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a team, these are the questions you have to ask. Different kinds of entrepreneurial passion. Well, there's lots of them out there. Prominent passion scholar, professor, professor Melissa Cardon has established a framework for distinguishing three types of passion among entrepreneurs. Some entrepreneurs are passionate for inventing. They focus on identifying new opportunities or creating new products and services. These are the typical scientists or product oriented entrepreneurs. That's me guys. I'm passionate about building new things. Some passion, some entrepreneurs are passionate for founding. They focus on startup and nurturing the initial revenue. These entrepreneurs get energized from creating the initial businesses. They often exit for a certain point and restart the process with a new venture. Actually, I could actually say that that's me as well. And other entrepreneurs are passionate for developing. They focus on building the venture and they get energy from growing the business, attracting new customers, hiring new employees and building an organizational culture. Hmm. This kind of sounds like me too, guys. <laughs> I guess I just love the entire process. You know, I guess I just love the entire process of building and, and meeting people. And, and you know what I, you know what I'm really passionate about though? What I'm really passionate about these days is not only doing something that's fun and something that can be lucrative in the long term. And, and, but man, I, I am passionate about working with fun people friends, not family, friends, good people. I'm passionate about who I work with. Like that right now is far more important to me than a lot of other things. We wanted to understand what happens to teams and their ventures that have these different kinds of passion. So we worked with an accelerator program in the Netherlands to collect information from a total of 251 entrepreneurs who are part of teams. One of the individual team members, 71% were male, with the average age of 34. The average education level was a master's degree, and 43% of the participants had prior startup experience. Well, I have three master's degrees. Maybe that makes me uber qualified. After a team was accepted into the program, we sent an online survey to all team members asking about their passion and drive for the company. Maybe that was the problem. Passion for the company? Mm, they just want a job, guys. We used, to validate, we, we used validated scales to measure passion, asking them to rate agreement with statements such as, searching for new ideas for product services to offer is enjoyable to me. Quote, establishing a new company excites me. And quote, assembling the right people to work for my business is exciting. We also collected control variables and asked about characteristics of their business and entrepreneurs' prior experiences. At the end of the 10 month program, all teams were evaluated by external venture capital investors on the quality of their business ideas and the amount of investment the team had received five years later. So maybe the problem is, is they were asking questions around, are you passionate about this business that you joined? You see, we have to differentiate here. Startup founders are a really unique breed of person. If we were to segment it into two simple segments, when it comes to the entrepreneurial journey or creating a startup company, there really are only two segments of people. There's the founders or the co you know, founder or co-founders who are ridiculously passionate about this market, this product, this service, this customer base, etc. And then there's employees. Sorry guys, it's founders and employees. Employees come from a different worldview. They come from a different mindset. They're looking for a job. They're looking for a salary, salary to support their lifestyle. Um, and they're also, the assumption is, they're desiring to move into a functional role that matches with their skill sets. 
but you can, they will never have as much passion for the business as the founders. And maybe that's the problem with this survey. So what are the effects of passion on entrepreneurial teams? Well, we found a clear negative effect. That's right, guys. We found a clear negative effect of a diversity of passion, including diversity in how passionate team members were, high versus low passion, as well as diversity in what they were passionate about, whether it was inventing, founding, or developing. The first pattern we saw on our data was that teams with members who varied in how passionate they were, example, Teresa was very passionate about the venture, but Tom was less so, had worse short-term performance in terms of the quality of their business plan and team dynamics. The second pattern we observed was that teams with entrepreneurs who varied in what they were passionate about, example, Jackie loved to tinker with product improvements, while John was excited to interact with our customers, had worse long-term performance and raised less capital after a five-year period. Why might these differences in passions hurt venture? Let's dig into a few anonymized examples from our data. I, can, I haven't read this article yet, guys, but I can tell you the answer. The answer is, is that you're trying to hire people that are passionate about your business. Let's be honest. I've said this multiple times so far. No, ain't nobody going to be as passionate about the business as the two founders or the co-founders or founder. It's just not gonna happen. And so it's the wrong question to ask. And every time that I've hired someone to my company, I've never asked them, are you passionate about this business? I'm, talk I'm trying to figure out whether they're going to be the best daggone functional role or they're gonna do the best daggone job at a functional role that I need. It's all tactical. It's all tactical, guys. And so if you're a founder, you should be asking those types of questions. To understand the first pattern, let's take a case of the Jumble team, where founding team members Emma and Sarah are very passionate about their venture. Bastion is moderately passionate, but Peter is not passionate about it at all. Then why the hell is he working there? That's the question I would ask. In this particular case, the two most passionate team members started to work and strategize their priorities without including the rest of the team, and short-term performance dropped immediately. The passionate team members, Emma and Sarah, started avoiding working and communicating with Bastion and Peter. This led to less teamwork and lower group cooperativeness, which decreased team performance. In contrast, look at the Catch-20 team, consisting of four entrepreneurs who were equally passionate. They reported fewer negative emotions to, to us in their surveys, and they worked more quickly than, and with more focus than the Jumble team. Because teammates were equally passionate, they engaged in participative decision-making instead of autocratic decision-making processes that characterize the Jumble team. Now let's look at the second pattern we observed. Teams that were entrepreneurs who varied in what they were passionate about had worse long-term performance and raised less capital after the five-year period. Hire for functional roles, not for passion, guys. Yali was a company that failed because it had three founders that were all extremely passionate for three different roles. Whereas Jan focused on technology and felt like a true inventor, Rob was very passionate for founding and Rita was very passionate for developing. When it comes time to make hard decisions, the three-headed structure really didn't work. The many different passions led to the team to pursue different goals, lose focus, and, and fail to reach consensus. It didn't work as a divide and conquer strategy because they didn't come back together around it as a shared goal. The Yali team performed worse and worse and eventually had to close their business. So what are the takeaways for teams and entrepreneurs? While passion is generally positioned as a, pos as a positive for entrepreneurship, our work suggests that entrepreneurs should consider the negative outcomes that passion can have among teams. In particular, founders should consider passion diversity when thinking about bringing new team members on board. Even if high diversity passion is not harmful during the early venture stages, it can present a great challenge during the later stages of venture development. In the early days, team members are often focused on the short-term goals, such as finding a first customer or getting brand exposure. Individual differences are, left, are often less exposed. But over time, the lack of consistent identity becomes more and more problematic as more impactful decisions are made and the team members invest more time in the venture. 
Our study also has implications for the incubator and investor community. During the investment process, investors tend to merely interview entrepreneurs about the financial metrics that, that they are fo forecasting. Our study shows that the included that the included few questions about passion in the interview techniques can provide insightful knowledge on the survival of a company over the long run. More specifically, accelerator programs and startup boot camps could design courses and personal growth sessions around the topic of team composition with an emphasis on passion diversity in teams. Especially for young startups that enter these programs, insights and dedicated sessions about the impact of various passions and ambitions within a team would add value. Often these teams are not yet complete and careful assessment of team passion could potentially improve the success rates of future hires and the team as a whole. I really enjoyed this article, guys, and I hope it was helpful as well as my nuggets. I will tell you guys, if you're a founder or entrepreneur or the entre pro curious and you're building a team, while I understand that you can ask them, you can ask your potential employees questions about their passion, let's be intellectually honest, guys. You're hiring them to fill a functional role that you need, whether it's sales, marketing, ops, development, product development, engineering. As the founder, if you're the founder, you should encompass the whole flaming hot ball of fire of passion for that business and for the company. For your employees, I would never expect the same passion. So asking these type, types of passion questions I don't know is exactly the right way to go. Let me know if you have any other suggestions on how or what types of questions you should ask when hiring team members to your startup. Let us know in the comments below. Let's go in to this next segment. New Harvard research proves being yourself at work will make you more successful. This is by Jessica Stillman. Fitting in is overrated, Melinda Gates recently replied when asked for her biggest piece of advice for young women. Young women? Hmm, maybe like me, guys. <laughs> nope. Quote, I spent the first few years at my job out of college doing everything I could make myself more like the people around me. It didn't bring out the best in me, she continued. Seek out people and environments that empower you to be nothing but yourself. Oprah Winfrey agrees. She quit storied news program 60 Minutes because it reserves, its reserved tone clashed with their own more emotional style. But let's be honest, it's scary to pass opportunities just because they don't align with your personality or values. It's intimidating to stand out in a particular office structure. And plenty of people will tell you the way to get ahead is to change yourself to meet expectations of others. Being yourself at work is hard. I understand this. I understand that it's hard to be yourself at work, especially if you're a guarded person or you're, it takes time to build relationships. I understand this. However, at the end of the day, I will tell you, it is far more liberating and freeing to just be yourself. And I'll give you a sec, uh, another a tidbit about this as we finish this article. Which is why new research out of Harvard is so valuable. It's basically scientific confirmation that Oprah and Melinda Gates are right. Increase your odds of success by a factor of three, according to the research. The series of studies by Harvard's Francesca Gino and colleagues followed the same basic template. Ask volunteers to either imagine or actually participate in a professional interaction, with some just being themselves and trying to make a good impression by anticipating the other party's desires. Then the researchers compared who impressed the most in the activity. All of the experiments pointed in the same direction. While people think catering to others will make people like them more, the truth is authenticity is far more effective way to impress. That's because pretending to be something you're not is exhausting and makes you look like a phony. Also, we're lousy at guessing what other people actually want. One particular study illustrates this well and will be a particular interest to business owners. As Gino explains in the write-up of her results for HBR, the researchers ask 166 entrepreneurs to pitch an early stage business idea to a panel of angel investors who then selected 10 semifinalists for a later round of pitching. After everyone presented, Gino's team polled the entrepreneurs about their approach to wooing the investment. Quote, we found that when entrepreneurs were genuine in their pitches, they were more than three times as likely to be chosen as semifinalists than when they tried to cater to the judges, Gino reports. 
Being yourself makes you three times more likely to be successful than trying to cater to what you think the other person wants to hear. That's a pretty huge payoff for authenticity. It might even be enough to get you over your jitters about following Oprah and Gates' advice. Well, I will tell you guys, here's the tidbit. People can smell bullshit a mile away. You might as well just be authentic. And it's okay. You know, just be yourself. Here's the tidbit that I want you to remember. Okay, and this has served me well. And I'm glad some of you guys have lasted this long in today, today's daily adventure show. In 100 years, no one's going to be thinking about you. Actually, frankly, no one thinks about you right now anyway. No one's going to remember the trials and tribulations of your life. No one's going to remember the successes and wins of your life. No one's going to remember any of the sad times or any of the failures or the mess-ups or mistakes or terrible decisions you've made. Frankly, you're not going to care because you're dead. And frankly, they ain't going to care because they did. Or those that are living, they don't even know you anyway. And so do act be yourself with radical transparency let it all out flaws and all people who see that you're willing to be your authentic self they're going to be the people that actually matter in the in the in the here and now you know and that that's just it that's just it i'm trying my best to be as authentic as i can online about my new project, my new venture, and where I'm headed. I think I'm doing a pretty good job. Uh, there are also mechanisms that I'm using that can you can see more of my personality, but this is just one of many ways where I'm practicing authenticity in my life. And I would suggest, I would highly suggest, I would say to you, all, all of you guys out there, if you wanna be successful as a founder or entrepreneur, being yourself, it's the only way to go. And that's it for today's two news bits with views from a founder or perspectives from a founder, guys. Let's get into, let's get into the final word. I want to tell you about a crappy venture capital meeting that I had yesterday, guys. Terrible. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Did you know that there's even more value than just audio or video? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at VC Hunting. And make sure to sign up for the VC Hunting newsletter, where you'll be able to get weekly news on venture capital, startups, founder stories, and the occasional wisdom extracted from Peter's brain. Go to vchunting.com to sign up. And now, back to the episode. So here's today's final word on this Tuesday in March, guys. We are moving along. Let's just get into it. So this is my opportunity to be radically transparent and authentic with you guys about what's going on in the business. As many of you guys know, I'm constantly having wonderful, mostly wonderful conversations with venture capitalists, investors, entrepreneurs, and founders. That way, I can understand how to best build what I consider to be a very unique and very different venture capital fund. However, not everyone in the world understands my passion leveraging the, 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 the two topics we've talked about today. Not everyone understands my passion, and that's totally okay. Sometimes even, like in yesterday's conversation with two VCs, both of them didn't understand anything I was saying. They didn't understand anything I was saying. It's not like I'm trying to ch fundamentally upend the venture capital world. It's not that I'm trying to fundamentally change the dynamics of, you know, uh, general partners and limited partner relationships or, found, or how, how you build an organizational structure around investing in founders and entrepreneurs. It's, I'm not doing anything that crazy. I'm just taking, I'm taking the building of the, the, the firm, the building of the venture firm from a different angle, from a social media angle, from a social angle and a community angle. What was so surprising to me, and this was, this was a little depressing as I was having this conversation with these two guys. What was so surprising to me is these guys have millions, tens of millions of dollars to invest in technology startups. However, both of them have no idea about two things, social and community. This was crazy to me. 
This was crazy to me that these two individuals with tens of millions of dollars to deploy into founders, young founders, technology startups, don't even know the value of community. Don't understand how community can be an unfair advantage, a competitive advantage. They don't understand how how user how a creating a venture fund focused on community could be a powerful competitive advantage for the future. And what made this meeting crappy? What made this meeting crappy? Because I'm a student of people. This is something I was telling my wife the other day, is that I'm a student of people. I work with people all day. That's all I do. I meet people. As a consultant, you guys know that I'm traveling out all across the world. As a consultant, I'm working with executives, leadership. Like my entire life has been serving people. I'm a student of people. And these guys, in terms of this last article that we read, they weren't authentic with me. Yeah, they were being authentic to the point of, of not, you know, telling me that they didn't understand the value of community, the value of social media. But they turned that into a condescending, uh, you know, conversation around. At one point, as I was explaining the value of community and how, you know, how we as founders leveraging community can get massive amounts of quick feedback on our iterations, our product cycles, and knowing what we need to build for the actual end user. As I was discussing this, he cut me off, and he said, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. how old are you again?" I mean completely a non-contextually relative question to ask me in the middle of me dropping into talking about the tactical and strategic value of leveraging your community for founders. Now, this was clearly a condescending cut in because he wanted to establish that clearly he was, I mean, I'm close to 40 guys. And he, he, wanted, to, he wanted to make sure that it was fundamentally clear that he had 20 plus years on me and that he knows best. And that, that everything that I was saying, even though he admitted up front that he didn't understand it, that he was telling, he told me that it wasn't going to work, that everything that I was talking about wasn't going to work. That's what made this a crappy conversation because open-minded individuals is always what I'm looking for. I'm open-minded. Tell me, tell me why, tell me why it won't work. Don't just tell me that it won't work. And so I asked the question, I said, okay, so help me, under, help me understand, what do you think would be a, a different way of approaching this? And what would be a different way of seeing this? Help challenge my thinking. I actually use that word, help challenge my thinking. And he shook his head. He said, all I know is it's not gonna work. Just because you have money just because you've successfully lived 60 years on the planet, you've created a great network and you have the ability to deploy capital, doesn't mean you have to have an ego the size of Mars. You know, I appreciate great conversations. You guys know, I have conversations, I ask tough questions all the time. But when you find a closed-minded person who's not willing to conversate and extrapolate and, 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 and to go into the details of what do I mean when I say, ask me questions. Functionally decompose what I'm talking about. I'll give you, if I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. But just to say outright that it's not going to work, why? I don't know, it's just not going to work. That, right there guys, is a closed mind. And I'm, I, I find it to be unfortunate and sad that this type of individual is investing in other companies and probably giving founders similar advice, right? The founder that they're investing in says, hey, I think about doing this or trying this for strategy or this for product development. And I'll just look at them and say, yeah, it's not going to work. Guys, don't be that type of person. Don't be that type of person with a closed mind who thinks you already have it figured out. Let me lean in, guys. Listen close. Nobody has it figured out. Nobody has it figured out. There's only one thing that I know for sure. That is, if you dedicate yourself to a noble and worthy goal every day, day in, day out, discipline day in, day out, 1% every day, you will achieve that goal. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep in contact with these two venture capitalists because, you know, it's, it's good to know people even though uh, they were just completely condescending to me in my, my youthful age of 40 years old or whatever. I'm going to keep in contact with them. You know why? Because I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it bigly. I'm going to create something massive. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting and it's going to be extremely hard. But guys, 
I'm not going anywhere. And I'm dedicating over a decade to this if it takes that long. That's what it takes, guys. That is what it takes. I hope this was an encouraging episode for you guys today. Enjoy your week, my friends. Enjoy your day. And I'll see you next time.